Talk with him. Uh, I don't know if many of you are aware of this, but today is Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, and pastors don't always have inside information. Sometimes we do. I, I can't really tell you who's going to win today, but I've got a pretty good idea who's going to lose. So if you give a $100 contribution to the Double R Impact campaign, I'd be happy to share that. Don't, don't pay attention that the lower left-hand corner has a deflated football there. Just don't, don't even look there, okay? Uh, listen. Jokes aside, this is our last week in talking about personal development and discipleship. Jesus calls us to be disciples. Jesus calls us to make disciples. It's so important to him, and he left us with a very clear charge, and it's the very purpose for which this church exists. As last year, our elder board worked through a, a new purpose statement for our church that we were developing, and that the first Baptist church of Elk Grove exists Two, and let's say these words together. Move people closer to Jesus. Now let's do that together, really, okay? Move people closer to Jesus. So wherever people are, we just want to help them take the next step in their pathway to discipleship. And we have created that pathway. And so when we talk about discipleship, we do so talking about these four verbs, connect, grow, serve, and reach. I want you to say those verbs with me as well. Connect. Grow, serve, and reach. So let's all make sure that we're all on the same playing field, on the same, working off the same page, okay? When we say connect at this church, this is what we mean. The people first, they make a vital connection with God through faith in Jesus Christ, and then they take the step of obedience of water baptism, okay? That's how you get the pathway started with God. And then you can not only connect with God, but you connect with the church. Jesus Christ loves the church, died for the church, and said, I will build my church. So we want to be a part of what he's doing. We do that here through membership. And as you saw in the announcements on the 22nd, we have a membership class that's already over 100 people. There's a lot of people that are going to go through it, okay? When we talk about growth, we're talking about vertical growth and horizontal growth, okay? Boy, I skipped way far ahead. Okay, let me see if I, if I can back this up. Okay, let's get that. There we go. Vertical growth has to do with our relationship with God, sending our roots down deep through healthy habits, uh, like Bible study and prayer, so that we grow tall in our relationship with God. Because that's the number one commandment, love God. But the second commandment is to love your neighbors yourself. And so we speak of horizontal growth as well, connecting ourselves in one another community. The Bible gives us all these one another commands. So we want to do life together. And that's why in the fall we're going to launch a small group ministry church-wide. We want to go from being friendly to having friends and connecting and doing life together. We think that's a New Testament um, value and we want that reflected in our church. Then we talked about service last week. I got to tell you some cool things that happened. Uh, and when we talk about service, what we mean is, is that we first of all discover our God-given hard wiring, what God has given to us by way of passions, natural abilities, spiritual gifts when we were born again, and then giving them back to God and serving other people. And what we mean is to regularly jump into serving. And uh, we had 80 people take the spiritual gifts inventory last week and several hundred over the last few years. So a lot of people at, at FBC have taken that. And, and I got a lot of emails this week thanking me and, and then for making that available. It's still on our website, so you can still do it. But we had like 80 people sign up, I think like for the first time to say, hey, I wanna, I wanna serve more around here. Let's talk about me getting into service, including a number of people volunteering for a parking team. So Lord willing, by Easter, we'll even have something like that. So thank you if you've responded to the Lord in that way, because we love this church and we want to serve this church. And we're here to, to receive, but we're here to give as well. This morning, we're at the last part of this pathway to discipleship or the last area of spiritual development, and we're going to call that reach or reaching. And in general terms, what I mean by that is that we help outsiders, people outside the family of God, to connect with Him. Okay? Now, I want you to see where this all starts. So let's go back to the Bible, to the Gospel of Matthew, to the 28th chapter, and let's read the famous last words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Because <laughs> we didn't invent this. This comes from the Lord. And we're just doing what He asked us to do. So I'm going to read from the 20th chapter of Matthew. Pick it up at verse 18. And this is what we read. Then Jesus came to them and he said, this is the resurrected Christ, who, by the way, is here with us this morning. 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. The word there is ethne, believe it or not. It doesn't speak of geographical boundaries of countries as much as ethnic groups. Reach all ethnic groups on planet earth for me. All nations. Make disciples of them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything, not just know it, but obey it. All that I've commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So what we see is we see Jesus giving us a call about going, about baptizing, about teaching, but the primary idea and the main verb and the main command there is to make disciples. We exist to make disciples. Now I want to show you something cool. Because at the end of each service, we, we do offerings. We receive tithes and offerings. And I want you to know that a good percentage of that actually goes to support missionary efforts around the world, supported by First Baptist Church. Did you know that? I want to show you this. I just, I just got this this week. But th we have a missionary task force around the world. These are missionaries and organizations that we support. And it's really exciting to think that there's so much reach going on through this church. And as I look at that, I thought, well, hey, we're done. Are we done? Is all, is all we need to do to just keep giving money and pray for these people like the Imbodens that are going to go out and do the job for us? I, I don't think so. Uh, there was a missionary that came home to visit a supporting church, and he knew this supporting church was not really reaching people, wasn't really doing evangelism, really wasn't planting churches. They really weren't involved in anything in their community. But when, they, when he came home, they sat down with him and they said, now we want you to be evangelizing about 20 hours a week and we want you to share your faith, this, and we want you to report back to us and we want you to plant churches. And at a certain point he said, stop. What right do you have to ask me to do over there what you're not doing right here? And it was a wake-up call for that church because we're not just doing missions over there. Did you know we're not really a church of Elk Grove, frankly. We have people from Sacramento, we have people from Lodi, even Galt. I don't even know what you call people from Galt. Galtese, whatever, but they come from Galt. And so, or Galtonians, or Gallbladder, I don't, whatever, I don't whatever. Whatever, I don't know what you call them, but they're here. If you're from Galt, I'm sure I'll get a letter for that. But, but just right here in this city alone, there are 100,000 people with no church affiliation that are going to go into a Christless eternity if you and I don't do something about it. I wake up thinking about that kind of stuff. That's how I'm hardwired. And so our job is not done. We're doing stuff, but we're not done yet. And we need to come back to our calling. And Jesus was a reacher, and we want to be like Jesus, so we need to be reachers, right? But before you start thinking this has to do with what we do or our behavior, I want to bring it back to what the goal of discipleship was, because is because we said it the first week. It is Christ-likeness. That is my goal in life. Principle number one, the goal of discipleship is to be like the one that we follow. I went and visited my parents' church. My parents live up in Grass Valley. About a year ago, a year ago, I went up there to visit their church, and they were doing a church function. I was talking with a guy I'd never met before, and he said, Way! I know who you are! You're the son of Ken Hansen, right? I said, yeah, how'd you know that? He said, because you look like him. Your hair is even like him. You talk like him. You walk like him. You're a chip off the old block. And I thought, really? When did I become my dad? You know. <laughs> but it's interesting, because isn't that really what we're shooting for as Christians too? That by the power of the Holy Spirit and cooperating with the Holy Spirit, that when people see us, not physically, but when they see us, in our words and behavior, they think we look an awful lot like Jesus Christ. Isn't that our goal? I think it's our goal. Do you know that in Acts chapter 11, the church up at Antioch became so Gentile-oriented, and they were, it wasn't a Jewish church that they had to find a new name to call these followers of Jesus, and they put the badge on them, Christian. That's where we first get the word Christian. And it was meant as a derogatory term, but it was worn as a badge of honor. You know what Christian means originally? It means little Christ's. It's a bunch of little Christ running around here, for crying out loud. Is that good or bad? I think that's wonderful. So if someone calls me a Christian in that vein, I love the title. I want to be a little Christ. John the Baptist um, had a wonderful ministry, but after a while, Jesus was becoming much more popular than John. 
And John's disciples were concerned about this popularity contest. And he said, hey, 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 stop, guys. And in John 3.30, this is what he said. He said, he, Jesus, must become greater. I must become less. He must increase. I must decrease. You guys ever read that verse? That's a great life verse because John the Baptist nailed it. If you want to enter into life, you've got to let the life, your life be filled up with Christ. And now don't hear what I'm not saying. Because it doesn't mean that God wants to annihilate your personality or bypass it. He gave you your personality. What it means is, is that by way of attitudes or words or deeds or thoughts, anything that does not reflect the life of Christ, God would like to surgically remove it from your life and replace it with the life of Christ. And it takes yielding. It takes work. It takes cooperation. It takes effort on our part, allowing God to mold the life of his son into us. And that's what we're shooting for. Spiritual maturity is Christ's likeness. And it comes by way of degrees. And it happens as our faith grows and our confidence in God grows. It's like the difference between believing in God and believing God. And there's a big difference there. We could talk about that some other time. But I heard this on the radio this week. It was, uh, it was well, I'm, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to tell you. Let me give you principle number two. Principle number two this morning is that reaching maturity on the pathway to discipleship re requires heart alignment with God. Spiritual maturity, reaching maturity, requires heart alignment with God. Have you ever had your back out, out, out of whack? Out of alignment? Yeah, I mean, if you have, you'll know it. I woke up one morning in the fetal position. I couldn't stand up straight. I, and it was temporary, but it was out of whack for sure. Man, you know it. Or your wheels out of alignment. You ever had that happen? I, I'm a little slow. My wife was in the car with me, and my steering wheel was shaking so much it was rattling my brain. She said, honey, your wheels are out of alignment. Well, we can be out of alignment with God, too. And the goal of our lives as Christians is to take the life of God and to make sure that our life gets into alignment with his life. Okay? That's what we're shooting for. <laughs> now I want you to think about this. As I started preparing this message, I did something dumb. And I'm going to share that with you. Because I started this message starting with the starting point being me and you. And then I realized how unwise that is. So I'm going to show you what I did that was wrong. And then you're not going to hear it. And then I'm going to undo it and show you what, a better approach. So let me show you the wrong approach first. Okay? Here's the wrong approach. Let's just imagine in our fragmented lives, because we all have these fragmented lives, that that little ant-shaped thing in the middle is you and me, okay? And these little circles of influence just come out from us. For example, we have work and we have family responsibilities. Don't forget you've got to go to Starbucks. And then, you know, you've got school. And then uh, neighbors, you've got relationships with neighbors. And then there's God and Christ. Hopefully that's on top. And then there's kids' activities if you have children. And then we got to think about having fun. It is Super Bowl Sunday, for crying out loud, right? And then home, you've got a house and you've got responsibilities of house. My wife made me work in the yard the whole day yesterday. I complained and had a bad attitude. But <laughs> Then there's church. You know, your pastor expects certain things, and I think God does too. And then you've got date nights. If you've got a relationship, you've got to maintain it, right? You've got to water that. Then there's government. Our mayor was in the second service, so I had to put that one up there. Uh, and, and then there's friends, and then there's old friends that are maybe a little distant from you. And you've got all this stuff going on. You might have family, two issues. And I'm talking about, hey, not just your immediate family, but your mom and dad, your brothers and sisters, and your aunts and uncles and all those people, right? And then uh, you might be divorced. And if that's the case, you've got an ex, and you've got those strained relationships and distance and maybe geographic separation with your children and all that. And then uh, uh, if you're married and your spouse works, that's all the stuff that comes with work number two. Are you tired yet? And then there's the commute time. And then, and then you got to think school number two because your kids probably don't go to the same school. And every kid you got, you maybe got three kids. They all have three activities a week. You're blowing your circuits boards, right? You got a lot of stuff going on here. And then you got to think in terms of emergencies because emergencies will come in. And then after that, I forgot what I put there. Let me see. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Money. Yeah. Oh, I can't forget that. I didn't put TV up there. I didn't want to embarrass anybody. But um, your money issues, you know, you got to retire someday and you got to think about savings and having enough. And your life is so full. And then you got to remember that you need pet, uh, pets. Yeah. We have our Yorkshire Terrier, little Kirby. He eats everything that we drop to the floor. That's why we call him Kirby, the vacuum cleaner. And then we, all, we also have, a, we all, we also have a, a, a pet fish that we call fish, I guess. I don't know what we call it. But, 
And then, and, then, and then you come to church and your pastor wants you to do all this stuff, like be spiritually reborn and to go through a membership and then, and then be in a small group and have spiritual disciplines and serve and reach. And you're thinking, for crying out loud, my life is already too full. Stop the world. I want to get off. And when I start saying, well, you know, you do need to be a reacher, you're going, oh, just one more thing I need to cram into my already overloaded life. That is the wrong way to approach heart alignment with God. And you didn't hear what I just did, okay? Now let's talk about the right way to do this. <coughs> you can't start with an overpacked life and simply try to figure out how to cram God in there somewhere. The Bible says in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and then get the other stuff in after that. You start with God. I was listening to the radio, almost slammed on my brakes when I heard this. I had to get it on my phone. This is what it said. Uh, it said on the Christian radio, is, you know you're a growing disciple when you regularly side with God against yourself. Think about that. You know you are a growing disciple of Christ when you regularly side or agree with God against yourself. In other words, if there's stuff that's out of alignment, instead of trying to justify it, you actually agree with God and you start working with the Holy Spirit to change it. I thought that was a great quote. No extra charge, by the way. So before you start considering what you need to cut or add to your lifestyle, we have to step back for just a second and ask the big question. What is it that is at the very core, at the very center of God's heart? What is there? Because whatever that is should be at the center of our heart as well. So what is there? You know, as I, I think about walking down this pathway to discipleship and seeking heart alignment, our heart is all over the place, right? It takes all kinds of journeys. And even, and even when we want to become more Christ-like, we're still kind of wandering around and trying to get it right as those circles. We're trying to balance all that stuff. And even when we get close, it's not quite there. It's hard to actually take that full journey and get into the very center of the heart of God. Even that isn't full alignment. That's full alignment right there. So how do we get full alignment? I think we have to start with God and ask ourselves, God, what's at the center of your heart? And here's what I've learned from the Bible. If you go all the way back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, God created a perfect world. That first family, he provided for all their needs. They had wonderful purpose. They had harmony with themselves, with the earth, with each other. And then they blew it and they fell into sin. So you begin to see the heart of God when you look at the response that God had towards Adam and Eve right after they fell. What were the first words God said to Adam and Eve after they sinned and fell in the Garden of Eden? You see, he told them that if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were going to die. So he could have said, oh, you're dead meat. Or you're crispy critters. Or you're toast. Or I told you so. But the very first words of God when the man and woman fell in the garden, were, were really instructive. He said, where are you? And he didn't need to ask them that. You think God doesn't know where you are? He could turn the lights off and go, he can't find me now. Wake up. So where are you this morning with God? And in your pathway to discipleship, where are you? You see, this, this book that we read, that we believe is inspired here, let me tell you what this is. This is a very long love letter. This is a God that we slapped in the face through disobedience when we cut our strings as marionettes collapsed on the floor, signing our Declaration of Independence. This same God that we offended said, I love you and I'm not giving up on you. And the whole Bible is this story of God wooing the human race back to himself saying, come back back to me. He's like a wounded lover that just wants us to come back to him. And that's what's at the core of his heart. He loves the lost. He loves the broken. He loves the fallen. And as we ring his bell when someone agrees with God and says, I've blown it. God, I need your help. Forgive me and save me. Take me in your family. And bam, you've rung the bell of God's heart. That's what's at the center of God's heart. I want you to look at Luke chapter 19, verse 10. And, and, and as your senior pastor, I'm going to take you to this passage so much that you're going to learn it by heart. And then I will have achieved my goal. I want you to get this because this is the purpose statement of Jesus Christ. 
This is why Jesus came to the earth. Luke 19.10. <clears throat> and in this, we see the simple words that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Do you see it there? I'm going to put those words up on the screen in case you have a slightly different translation. Let's read them together. Ready? The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. You don't have to wonder what's at the core of God's heart. It is so clear. And my point is, if we follow God in Christ, and that's the most important thing to God, then a journey into his heart will make that the most important thing to us. Principle number three. Reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ is more than a Christian duty. It's a matter of heart alignment. And it's interesting, just before Jesus ascended back up into heaven, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he didn't say, now I want you to go out and do a bunch of witnessing. He actually said, you are my witnesses. It's an identity issue. By being my followers, you are to tell people what you've seen and heard. By nature, you are witnesses. So I want you just to do that. And the Apostle Paul says it with a little stronger language. In 1 Corinthians 9, 16, he says, when I preach the gospel, I can't brag about it because I'm compelled to preach. Then he says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel because that's his mission and that's our mission. It's why we exist, to be witnesses for God. Now be careful here because it'd be easy for you to walk away this morning saying, ah, what this means is, is that we're supposed to be sharing our faith as another Christian duty. It's something that God did command us to do, but I want to repeat, if we are disciples of Christ, whatever is most important to Christ needs to be most important to us. And it's really more who we are than what we do. I've worked through the Gospels, and I've got to tell you, I've found four possible attitudes that we can have towards lost people. First attitude would be that we hate them. And if they're outside of Christ, we just want them to go to hell. We just, I don't think there's a lot of people like that this morning here. Really, I don't. Uh, but I have met some people like this. The religious leaders in Jesus' time, many of them were like this. Second possible attitude would be to view them with indifference. And I think what happens is our lives get so full that we just don't have an awful lot more room in our heart. So we just sort of see people as furniture. We don't really see them as the image of God needing God. And then the third possible attitude would be to receive them when they draw near, which is good, but think about it. If that was all we did as a church, we, we're basically saying, okay, we'll let you have God, but you have to come to us on our terms. Then there's a fourth attitude, and that fourth attitude is to actively seek them out. Okay, we go out and we find them. Now think about this. The first two attitudes were reflected in the religious leaders in Jesus' day, and they accused him of number three, but he actually was guilty of number four. Jesus did not wait for people to come to him. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He went on the road and went after them. He didn't wait until they came to him. Are you with me, church? This is huge. So in the middle of the Gospel of Luke, we find this chapter, chapter 15, and there's three parables. And what Jesus does is he just opens up the heart of God so we can all see it. And he talks about a lost sheep and a lost coin and a lost son, really two lost sons, one far away, one at home, and how God, God is a seeking God trying to draw people back to himself. And there's a chorus inside these parables that reads like this. I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I wonder if you ever thought about that. I tell you. There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Does not mean the angels are rejoicing. There is rejoicing in front of them in their presence. It is God who's rejoicing. It's God who flips the party switch. Because that's what rings his bell. You know what rings my bell? Honey walnut shrimp at Panda Express. <laughs> that rings my bell. I start salivating just thinking about it. Sorry. You know what rings God's bell? When one person that he made in his image agrees with him that sin is sin and it's time to knock it off and to turn to God and tell him we're sorry and that we want life in Jesus' name and we get it, we can't do life by ourselves and we just, we repent and we turn our life over to God. That rings God's bell. And so I hope that as you take your journey into discipleship, that starts ringing 
your belt as well. Principle number four. A lifestyle of reaching others outside the family of God starts with entering into the heart of God. <coughs> now, I, and I've done this, and I probably will do it in the future. I could give you a big how-to sermon on how to share your faith. And incidentally, in your programs this morning, there's a brochure. Let me see if I found it. It's a reach guide, right? On the back of this, we actually have a, a seminar next Saturday morning. Phil Fuller, our own Phil Fuller, from 9 to 11, is going to do a seminar on how to share your faith story. So if, and anybody that's born again has a faith story, but we don't always know how to share it. So if you'd like to learn how to share your faith story, come to this Contagious Christianity uh, seminar. Phil's a great guy. He's a wonderful teacher. So come on out to that because we want to help you figure this out. We don't want to leave you on your own to try to just make it work somehow. But before we talk about all the how-tos, let's just start with, the, hey, you have to first want this. You have to pursue it. You have to yield to it. And let's just be honest. Discipleship is not easy at all because it goes against our nature. Christian discipleship is hard. And it goes against our human nature. Particularly when you start talking about reaching. Have you ever noticed that when it comes to reaching people that are far from God, that your throat gets dry? That you get a little knot in your stomach? That you start shaking, your hands maybe sweat a little bit? You know why? Because it goes against your nature and it's spiritual warfare, that's why. And I want to just confront something here because our natural tendency is to pull away from addressing other people's spiritual needs. Because there might be discomfort in that. And there might be misunderstanding. And we might lose a friendship. And we might have a little confrontation as worldviews collide. And maybe get accused or called some name or rejected. And who naturally wants that? Who would naturally gravitate to that? You know, my wife and I left in 1987 to become missionaries in Italy. And when we came back in 2004, we discovered that America had changed. And the number one virtue in America when we got back was tolerance. Tolerance. Let me tell you something, folks. Tolerance is just indifference or disdain in disguise. And it is not my number one virtue. Love is my number one virtue. And love will tell people when they need help. Tolerance will just live and let live. You know that old Paul McCartney song? Do, 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 right? Remember? <laughs> love doesn't do that. Love will tell people the truth. Not, not harshly, but they'll tell you the truth. I, and there's an urgency here, folks. Hell is real. Hell is real. And just like the last minute and the last seconds are going to click off the clock and one team's going to win and one team's going to lose today, uh, I want you to know that uh, our clock is going to stop ticking one time here on earth, and as is everybody else's. And at that point, uh, the game's over at least on this side of eternity. I remember one time I was a teenager, I was probably about 13 years old, and I just busted into our neighbor's house. They were eating, having a private meal, and I just busted through their, I mean, I opened it, right? And I just came in, and they were shocked when I came in. I didn't knock, I didn't, I didn't give them any warning, I just came in and I ran straight to their phone. The father stood up to me, oh, oh dear, you know, all that stuff. And why did I do that? Because I'm stupid, right? Well, maybe there's that, but... It was because the house next door was on fire. And there was a little girl inside. Cindy was inside that house. So I didn't have time to politely tap on the door and wait for a response. I busted into that house, grabbed the phone, called the fire department, and, and told the dad, go get a hose. I'm not saying be rude, church. I'm just saying there's a lot of people that are on fire right now. And so we need to be a bit more bold. I think it's Proverbs 28, 1. If it's not, find it. It says, the wicked flee even when no one's chasing, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. You know, lions don't retreat. We need to be reachers for Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what we mean when we say reach around here. When we say reach around here, first thing we mean is you've got to learn how to tell your faith story. And again, if you're a born-again believer, you have a faith story. But not all people are good at telling their faith story. You know, my faith story has to do with the death of my brother in a car accident. And I share it on a regular basis because I know there's a lot of people that share that pain. 
Whatever your faith story is, if you want to learn how to do that better, come to Phil Fuller's workshop next Saturday, okay? But learn how to tell your faith story and articulate it well. Number two, we also are, are, are encouraging you to be participating in missional experiences. What does that mean? It just means um, opportunities on your own, in your neighborhood, at your work, at your school, but also organize things by the church and organizations that we support in the community. So we get outside our walls and we actually serve and love and share the love of Christ with people beyond the four walls of FBC. And inside that brochure that we've given you today, that, that opportunities, that uh, reach opportunities brochure, there's a number of things here that talk about local organizations as well as short-term mission trips that we're going to be taking this summer. They're all there. We'd love you to be involved. We'd love you to say, hey, I want to go to India this summer. I want to go to Mexicali or Uganda. I want to get involved in some missional experience to take the next step into what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to give my faith away. I'm telling you, I'm just warning you, if you do it, it'll change you, though, okay? But maybe you need change. Learn how to share your faith story and participate in missional experiences. But again, we come back to this question of how much are you willing to pay? To gain heart alignment with God, how much are you willing to pay? To reach the lost, how much are you willing to pay? What would you be willing to sacrifice to get there in your life? Because, I, I mean, I learned how to do this, but there was a sacrifice involved. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. In the New Testament, it's like the sixth book in. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans 9. This is an interesting story about the Apostle Paul who tells us what he would be willing to give to reach the Israelites with the gospel. Because Israel, by and large, missed their Jewish Messiah. And so the gospel goes to the Gentiles. But listen to his attitude here. <coughs> In Romans chapter 9 and verse 2, it says this. I have great sorrow and, in, and, and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. He's saying, if I could make this trade for my salvation, for all their salvation, I'd do it. I mean, he would be willing to go to hell. How much do you want this in your life? What would you be willing to give to see it happen? And now I'm going to apply this on something very specific to our church, so I want you to pay attention. There's been ongoing conversation at the leadership level of this church for several years now concerning the name of our church, First Baptist Church of Elk Grove. And as I was candidating as the senior pastor for this church, it became evident that this church experienced explosive growth in the 90s, but then around the year 2000, it plateaued and stayed the same for many years and even declined a little bit over time. Still a great church. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But it stopped growing. Why? Well, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, but I think probably the biggest reason is we stayed the same and the culture around us changed. And it changed a lot. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Significant studies have been conducted in the area of church names and branding and all that. And the general conclusion has been that the term Baptist carries a lot of cultural baggage that may be working against us right now. And again, a lot of great things have been done by Baptists and Baptist churches, and uh, so this one stings a little bit, particularly if you've grown up Baptist or most of your life you've been a Baptist. But I want you to know that one study that I read this week said that only 14% of Americans have a favorable view of the term Baptist. So I'm wondering, are we creating a wall instead of a bridge with our church name? I know that one stings, folks. But I think that particularly given the, the, the historical commitment of the Baptist denominations to the Great Commission, wanting to reflect the reaching heart of Christ, we ought to revisit this question. And we ought to ask ourselves, and at the leadership of this church, the elders also, they, they, they understand that what used to be, uh, and it still is a high honor, we're not talking about leaving a denomination or changing doctrine here, guys, but could it be that this amazing location that we have here, we're not using it to our fu fullest extent because all the people that drive by, only 14% of those people view the term Baptist in a positive light. And we're guilty by association, by anything that's ever been done that's bad by Baptists. I want you to think about that. Because here's, what, here's where we've landed. We've landed as an elder board in concluding that our current name actually is a wall rather than a bridge. And it reflects 
in the eyes of people outside the church, exclusiveness rather than inclusiveness. And quite frankly, simply state that our current name now works against our purpose of making disciples and reaching the lost. And so our elder board has concluded it's time to change the name of our church. Hold on, I'm not done yet. Whether you're gonna throw eggs or claws, whatever. I could talk about how, to, how the mention of the word Elk Grove in our title no longer is true because we're a regional church that happens to be on a freeway in Elk Grove. We're not really a church of Elk Grove anymore. We got people coming all the way from Roseville. I could talk about how our church family is no longer made up primarily of people from a Baptist background and how it's more accurate to say that we're a congregation of people made up, made up of evangelical Christians from many denominational and non-denominational backgrounds. But I'm not going to talk about that. I could talk about how Jesus actually commands us to make disciples, not Baptists. But I'm not going to talk about that. I could talk about how our, amaz our amazing location on Freeway 99, we're not utilizing it very well because of the name we've chosen. We have thousands of people driving by every hour, and we could come up with a name that's more intriguing that builds a bridge and piques curiosity. I don't even care what it is, quite frankly. It could be roadside assistance. I don't care. You know, it's, a, it's a dumb name, but you see what I'm saying? I mean, it would just all of a sudden be, you know, exit now, whatever. I don't care. It is a, but we're not utilizing our location, and we have a spectacular location. But I'm not going to talk about that either. I could talk about the fact that the vast majority of churches in our very own denomination, North American Baptists, have now removed the term Baptist from their title. We're one of the last holdouts. The vast majority. I could tell you that the denominational leaders in California of this denomination sat across the table from me and said, when are you going to change your name so that you reach the lost? But I'm not going to talk about that either. Because it all boils down to one thing, and I want you to hear me, church. It all boils down to why we exist. And we exist to make more Christians evangelism and better Christians discipleship. And if anything comes in the way of our mission, in the name of God, we should remove it or change it. That's why. And I know that's a tough one. Because it's been First Baptist since 1948. But last Monday night, our elder board voted unanimously and enthusiastically to enter into a season where we're going to move towards changing the name of our church. I want, I, want you to get, I want you to understand this as a principle. The Apostle Paul was probably the greatest missionary besides Jesus of all. And the Apostle Paul was Jewish, but when he was with the Gentiles, he behaved like a Gentile. When he was with the Romans, he behaved like a Roman. When he was with the Greeks in Athens, he behaved like a philosopher. Paul was so adept at changing his methodology. Message never changes. Package or methodology can change continually. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 22. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. Because his goal wasn't the outside package or the titles and all that. The goal was the mission, the mission, the mission. Reach the lost for Christ. Reconnect them to God. And so let me just tell you about the process. Uh, we created this document. It's called Our Vision, Our Name, and Our Future. You can pick that up at guest services if you want. In the month of February, we're asking you, based on what we've talked about this morning in this document here, that if you'd like to give some name suggestions, you can add that to a growing list of names that we've kind of scoured through the internet, okay? In the month of February. And then uh, our staff, and we're working with a number of experts in our congregation, are going to work through these name suggestions filter them through the purpose and the history of this church and all that, and we're going to come back with our best recommendations at an information meeting on March 8th, and then we're going to talk about it some more, and then on April 19th, two weeks after Easter, we're going to have a congregational vote, and we're just going to see if this is what we want to do, okay? But our elder board, and I, I fully agree with this too, has agreed that we believe it is the Lord's leading that we change the name of this church in the name of the Great Commission. Even though we're comfortable with First Baptist, it's not working for us like it used to work for us. But I don't want you to get so distracted by this application, you miss the big issue here. Because the big issue is reaching people that are far from God. And a name change doesn't solve every problem. We have to become a church of reachers. And we've talked about intentional discipleship over the last four weeks. And what we mean by that, we, we, want, to, we want to make disciples not in spite of ourselves, but very intentionally and purposefully and aggressively pursue this. I would like to ask you to aggressively pursue this. And so, <laughs> let's remember that one of the most common things Jesus said was, you, follow me. Follow me. And when we talk about following Jesus, our pathway looks like this. 
uh, when we talk about connecting, it's connecting with God through faith in Jesus Christ and water baptism, and then connecting with a local church, in our case, through membership, where you go from being on the periphery of the church to getting into the core of the church. When we talk about growing, we talk about vertical, grow vertical growth with our relationship with God through healthy habits and horizontal growth by connecting in one another community with other Christians. And that's why we're gonna launch a small group ministry in the fall. When we talk about serving, we're talking about figuring out how God has given us unique hardwiring and spiritual gifts and abilities and then giving them back to God by serving other people. And we start at the church. We don't stop there, but we start there. And then we discover our unique hardwiring and then we give it back by regularly serving. And then finally, we talked reach, about reach this morning. And what we mean is learning how to share your faith story and then getting involved in missional experiences. That's a big expression, missional experience. Getting involved in giving your faith away by reaching your neighborhood and your work and your school and your community and then your world. That's what we mean. As your senior pastor, can I ask you to do something this year? Can I, even in the next weeks and months to come, can can? Wherever you are on this pathway to discipleship, would you please take the next step? Let God stretch your faith and take the next step. And I want you to know that discipleship is messy and it isn't linear and it may not always work in this order. Some people start by uh, serving, others start by growing and then they discover and they get born again. I don't really care because really in a sense, it's circular if you think about it because as we connect and as we grow and as we reach, serve and as we reach, we reach people far from God, and then they connect and grow and serve and reach, and it just keeps going. It feeds on itself, right? But I, I got to close with a story because I, I love doing this. I keep this in my top dresser drawer or my desk drawer here at the church. This is a gunshot shell, okay? It's still loaded. Oh, sorry. I've been carrying it around in my pocket all day long. I'm a bonehead. I had a guy come to me and give this to me. Let me tell you his story. His name is Paul. He just lived up the street from where I pastored in Fresno. And he loaded this in a shotgun. It's pretty violent. But he loaded it in a shotgun and was about to pull the trigger. He had had it with life. It was, he couldn't make any sense of it. He was distraught all the time. He was about to pull the trigger and end his life. And he heard a voice, I kid you not, that said, go to the church just up the street. And that, we were that church up the street. And it wasn't Sunday. So he just followed the voice and came and just sort of stood there in our campus. Until somebody said, can, can we help you? And he said, I just I heard a voice that said, I was supposed to come to this church, so here I am. You have somebody I can talk to? And they said, well, I want to talk to Scott. He never does anything, so. <laughs> That's not fair, is it? But whatever. And he walked into my office and he said, I'm about to commit suicide. Give me a good reason why I shouldn't do that. And you take people seriously when they say that, right? By the way, this is what you call a divine appointment, in case you missed that. I'm just like, <laughs> God's working. And I said, well, reason number one you shouldn't take your life is you should never enter into the presence of God uninvited. You let God decide when you're going to leave this earth, not you. Never. Okay? But listen, I, and I hope you agree with that. But it's more importantly, I told him, Paul, I said, there's a reason that that voice spoke to you, and it's because there is a God who made you, and he loves you, and he's loved you every nanosecond of your existence, and he's got a design for your life, and it's not over. It's just getting started. There is a Savior that bled and died on a cross for you to buy you back and to give you life, not to take it from you, and you need to surrender to that. You need to agree with God that you screw things up. He's crying. He's shaking. You know, and, and finally, I just I let, let him to faith in Christ. I'm not the message. I'm not the Savior. I'm the messenger, right? But I got to reach that day. And this guy surrenders his life to Christ, and he comes to church on Sunday, and he's all beaming and happy, and he gives me this shout, and he says, here, I don't think I'll need this anymore. I said, okay. <laughs> but the story keeps going. It keeps going. I got to be careful. I don't do anything crazy. Don't hit me hard after the service. Listen. He said this to me. He said, thank you for saving my life. And I said, Paul, stop right there. Scott did not save your life. Don't mix me up. I'm just the messenger here. I wasn't there in your room saying, go visit the church down the street. That was God tapping you on the shoulder because he loves you. And I want you to hear me, church. God's doing this all over the place. 
And all he needs is reachers to get into the equation so that we help make the connection. This is a Holy Spirit thing. We're not our by, by ourselves on this thing. God is out there fishing, and he just wants us to grab a pole and go with him. And I'm telling you, it's the biggest high you could ever experience. I'm a crooked, fallen sinner, and I get to lead people across the line of eternity, and, and, and God can change their life forever. That's better than any drug you could ever take. You're going to forget a few years from now who won the Super Bowl today. You will not forget this message that Jesus and Jesus alone saves forever. You'll never forget that. And God is calling us to be a church of reachers. So whether that means changing our clothes or changing our name or whatever it means, let's become all things to all people so that by all possible means we might save some. I want to close with a great verse. And it's really my prayer for all of us. Okay? This is Paul in that little postcard called Philemon, verse 6. And this is what he says. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you may have a good understanding, so that you may have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Now, I, this is kind of weird, but I actually want to pray for you with my eyes open. I want to pray this prayer over you. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you may have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. 